I'm the outpatient oncology dietitian for Smilo Cancer Center in Trumbull and in Fairfield. Um, I primarily work out of Trumbull, but I do see patients from Fairfield as well. So um, let me see. Okay. So um, again, I'm Hannah. I've been the outpatient oncology dietitian uh, for Smilo for Trumbull and Fairfield since October of 2021. Um, I went to UConn, uh, University of Connecticut, and I grew up in Connecticut, go Huskies. Um, and in my spare time, I do love to cook. Um, I like to run and I like to hike and I also do CrossFit. So that's how I stay active. And it's something that I really am passionate about. So the objectives for this presentation um, are to discuss how diet and lifestyle um, can be related to cancer risk and risk reduction um, and how they are not. So we're going to discuss how to kind of best optimize your nutrition and activity um, to help promote um, not only just a healthy lifestyle, but to help reduce your risk of, of cancer and um, of recurrence of cancer. We're going to discuss some popular diet trends and nutrition myths and clear up any confusion that you may have surrounding food and cancer. Um, and I'm going to provide you some tips and tools to help you live your healthiest life. Um, so I love talking about diet and exercise, um, uh, you know, and how it relates to cancer and um, kind of dispelling any misinformation. So again, if you have any questions at all, just put them in either the chat or the Q&A. So the relationship between cancer and obesity. So Something that um, we as providers and as um, oncology professionals, um, you know, something that we see in the research often is that obesity and excess body fat is, um, is a, a risk factor for many different types of cancers. So you guys can see on the graphic um, to the left that it is a, um, a risk factor. Having excess body fat can be a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, as well as other different types of cancers, such as liver cancer, stomach cancer. Um, it's not the only risk factor, obviously, but it's something that is um, controllable. And um, the reason why excess body fat tissue may affect cancer risk is that it promotes inflammation in the body. Um, it can influence cell and blood vessel growth. Um, excess body fat tends to lead to rises in certain levels of hormones, such as insulin and estrogen and insulin-like growth factor, which um, are all um, very anabolic substrates in the body. So, um, you know, having excess body fat tissue on you um, can be a risk factor. And, you know, a lot of the time when you go to the doctor, um, they use something called the body mass index as a uh, as a tool to see if you are at risk for certain health conditions. Um, and, you know, body mass index really doesn't take into account somebody who has a lot of muscle. So um, we like to look at other things as well. We like to look at blood sugar levels and um, blood lipid panels and things like that to determine if you're at risk for, for certain things. But um, body fat can be a pretty good indicator um, as well. So it's just something to consider. So how do we reduce excess body fat? Um, so first of all, weight reduction is not something that we recommend for those undergoing active treatment for cancer. So someone um, who is undergoing chemotherapy or radiation or who has just had surgery, um, you know, if they're coming to me for nutritional guidance, I don't recommend weight loss at that time. I think that um, we need as much of our lean body mass and our muscle and um, you know, we need to be eating in not a calorie surplus, but, um, you know, eating enough to sustain our weight during, during active treatment. However, um, if you're at a point where you are past your treatment or you are um, just trying to prevent cancer from occurring um, in the first place, reducing excess body fat is, um, you know, one of those ways that you can do that. So we do this by eating healthy, balanced meals that contain protein and healthy fats, whole grains, and fruits and vegetables. Um, we like to tell people to limit consumptions of food uh, and drinks that are high in refined sugars and saturated fats. 
We like to tell people to limit eating meals uh, at restaurants and fast food um, as much as possible. I know that that's not, you know, the reality for many people, um, but, you know, trying to make smart, healthy choices while you're out at a restaurant is, you know, a good starting point. Um, and focusing on protein intake, especially in the morning. So um, those are all good ways to help keep our body fat percentage low. Um, and I'm going to go way more into this uh, as well. So let's see. So what does a balanced meal look like, right? I get this a lot, um, you know, and I certainly am not um, perfect myself with eating balanced meals 100% of the time. But um, if you can eat balanced meals 80% of the time, you know, that's better than uh, better than nothing. So a nutritionally balanced meal that will help you feel full and satisfied will often have a complete protein source. Um, it will have fiber rich fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, color, right? We get lots of our vitamins and minerals and antioxidants from vegetables and fruits that have lots of colors um, and flavor and seasonings based on your taste and your cultural preferences as well. So, um, you know, we live in Connecticut, we live in a pretty diverse area of the state, you know, the southern, um, southern part of the state, uh, we have many, many different cultures and um, you know, those foods contain different seasonings and flavors and things. So we want to be, um, we want to be aware of, of those practices as well, uh, and respectful of everybody's choices with how they, they flavor and season their food. So this is something that I like to counsel my patients on, um, kind of regardless of where they are at in their treatment, um, or in their journey. Um, so I like to tell people that muscle is the organ of longevity. So, um, our muscle tissue, our lean body mass, you know, on our, on our arms and our legs and, um, you know, everywhere in our body, right. Lean body mass is often referred to as the organ of longevity because it, um, it allows us to, um, maintain our strength, right. And our, um, our energy levels during our treatment, um, and, you know, the research does show that better treatment outcomes, you know, better effectiveness of chemotherapies and radiation um, and surgery are outcomes are better when we maintain more of our lean body mass. So uh, it's crucial for maintaining strength and balance. Bone health um, helps us to reduce systemic inflammation in the body, which is uh, key, also key for uh, a well-functioning metabolism as well. So um, maintaining our muscle is very, very important. Uh, especially as we age also, right? We want to be um, aware of our bone health and how um, bone density can often decrease as we age and maintaining more of your muscle can actually help with our bone density as well. So one of the most important things that I um, counsel my patients on is protein intake. I find that, um, you know, especially with um, questions of whether or not we should be telling our patients to adopt a whole plant-based diet, right? Um, eating no foods that come from animals or, um, you know, eating only plant-based foods. Um, protein is often, you know, how do I get enough protein? That's a question that I get often. Um, so protein is made up of amino acids. That's its most basic building block. Um, and it is the building block for our lean body mass for our muscle. Um, so complete proteins, which come from our diet, right, are um, proteins that contain all nine of our essential amino acids. So these are often found in animal sources, things like eggs, chicken, fish, um, turkey, other lean proteins. Um, protein is also found, though, in foods like whole grains. So things like um, rice or um, quinoa, things like that. Um, it's also found in beans, legumes, nuts and seeds, and also in certain vegetables. Um, and studies show that eating more protein during the day can help to regulate our appetites, keep us full and satisfied, and help us to lose body fat. So um, the more protein you eat, the more muscle you retain, and the higher um, muscle amounts that you have in your body, the higher your metabolism is. So, um, you know, it, it can help to reduce body fat in that way. So how do we build more muscle, right? I was just talking about this. Um, so research shows that eating about 1.2 to 1.5 
grams of protein per kilogram of body weight or 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight allows us to gain lean body mass, to gain muscle. Um, so it's really important to um, not get hung up on the, um, the total amount per se of protein that we're getting in a day, but to make sure that we are also um, focusing on getting protein at each meal, right? You know, about 20 to 30 grams of protein um, in, you know, a few of your meals during the day can often be enough for most people. So um, that's the food side of things. And then also to, in order to build more lean body mass, more muscle, we have to be using our muscles. So um, resistance-based training or exercise such as weightlifting, or Pilates, um, hiking, certain types of yoga, anything that puts the body under load um, is going to be really good for building lean muscle and really good for, um, you know, it, you do burn a lot of calories while doing resistance-based training, and it also helps us with our balance and our, our bone health as well. So um, in addition to all of these things, we want to make sure that we're getting adequate sleep um, and hydration as well. Water is very important. Um, so this is kind of the, the toolbox for how we build more lean body mass. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk um, a little bit about fiber. So I was talking about protein before, and that comes from a lot of our animal sources um, of food. Dietary fiber comes from our um, plant foods, right? Our fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, things like that. Um, so dietary fiber, it's often called roughage or bulk, um, is the material in plant foods that the body can't fully digest. So fiber is important because it keeps us full for longer. Um, it helps to maintain our bowel health and digestion. It acts as a prebiotic or fuel for good bacteria, probiotic bacteria in the gut. Um, and it helps us to lower our uh, blood sugar levels and our cholesterol levels as well. So um, eating more dietary fiber, more plant foods, right? Um, more of these indigestible carbohydrates. Um, can it has been shown to reduce incidence of colon cancer in particular because um, you know all of that bulk that roughage kind of helps to um, you know keep things moving keep things moving along in our digestive tract so fiber is very important almost as much as our protein intake. So how do we add more fiber to our meals right so. Um, I get questions often about what do I think about adding um, Metamucil or like a fiber supplement, right, to our uh, breakfast. And um, what I tell people is if you're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, you're probably getting more than enough fiber, um, you know, more, more than you need to, uh, to, that you would get from a supplement. So um, adding fibrous fruits and vegetables like broccoli, asparagus, cauliflower, zucchini, um, to pasta dishes or with a protein like a chicken or a fish with dinner. Um, that's probably our number one way that we're going to get more fiber in our diet. Adding things like beans to chilies or stews, soups. I know we're kind of in the, um, you know, the beginning of our spring and summer season. So maybe not as much soup happening at this moment, but um, it does add some bulk and some protein as well. Um, and then adding nuts and seeds such as almonds, walnuts, and flaxseed to our yogurt in the morning or oatmeal or smoothie um, can add uh, added fiber and also omega-3 fatty acids, which are very important. They're um, anti-inflammatory. Uh, omega-3 omega fatty acids are good for our heart health as well. So um, that is another benefit that they offer to us. So the role of carbohydrates in a healthy diet, right? So um, dietary fiber, we were just talking about that, you know, those are our indigestible carbohydrates that we get from foods, um, but we need carbohydrates from um, our starches and fruits and things like that, that we can digest um, as a source of energy, right? Carbohydrates are our primary source of energy in the body. Um, carbohydrates come from foods like vegetables, grains, pastas, bread, um, and they convert to glucose in the body. That's its most uh, basic form. 
and um, they are our primary source of fuel um, for our brain, for our muscles. Um, so we do need them to power our brains and give our muscles energy. So um, carbohydrates are very important. I think the majority of our calories from the day probably come from carbohydrates, um, you know, without us even knowing it. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that what's happening right now in um, kind of the wellness and nutrition sphere is that um, low carbohydrate diets are very popular, um, particularly for weight loss. And I think when people do these kinds of diets, um, they become very tired and very fatigued. So, um, you know, I, I think this is, it's good to notice that when you're not getting adequate carbohydrates in your day, um, you do feel very, very low on energy, um, which is not great. So um, we do need carbs. So this is uh, the number one question that I get, um, I think from many, many of my patients, um, does sugar, is sugar feeding cancer? Um, or, you know, does eating more sugar uh, during the day, does that um, increase my risk of developing cancer? And the answer to that question is no, does not. Um, again, our bodies need carbohydrates to run properly. Um, and eating foods like fruit or bread or rice or things that are going to give us energy does not directly cause um, cancer to grow or spread or, um, you know, to, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't have that kind of impact, right? So cancer cells do have their own unique metabolism um, and they will find energy to, if they're going to grow or um, if cancer is going to occur, um, they will find energy from other sources in the absence of carbohydrates. So what I like to tell people is even if you're not eating carbohydrates in your diet or you're not eating sugars, um, your the cancer cells that are present, if they are present, are going to find um, energy from the breakdown of your muscles, which is not good. It's not something that we want. So um, we do tell people to try to limit the amount of sugar that they're getting from foods that are high in refined carbohydrates. So this would be things like soda or candy or um, ice cream, things like that, um, because they tend to increase body fat and the impact of having more body fat um, can kind of indirectly lead to an increased risk of, of cancer. Um, but sugar, eating things like fruits and um, kind of whole sources of carbohydrates doesn't directly impact um, cancer risk. So can we include dairy products? This is another big question that I get from many of my patients. Um, can dairy products be included in a cancer prevention uh, lifestyle and diet? And yes, you can. Um, you can have dairy products as part of a healthy, balanced diet. Um, dairy products, especially foods like low-fat milk, cheeses, Greek yogurt, um, cottage cheese are um, very high in protein, very high in vitamin D um, and calcium, which help to keep our bones healthy. Um, and you know, if you do have an intolerance to something like lactose, which is the sugar that's found in um, dairy products, you can try a lactose-free version of your favorite dairy foods um, or take a lactase enzyme. Something like a lactate um, can help to break down that, that sugar in our, um, in our digestive system and not cause things like gas or pain or um, anything like that. So dairy products can be included in a, in a healthy diet. Um, you know, I think that telling people to try to stick on the low fat uh, end of things can help to reduce excess calorie intake, um, but dairy products can definitely be included. So do I need to eat all organic foods? Uh, organic foods are, um, you know, that's a, another question that I get often from patients. Um, unfortunately, there's little evidence to support that eating all organic foods all the time will prevent cancer. Um, you know, the, the definition of something being organic um, in the food supply just means that they are not um, treated with chemical pesticides um, or anything that's not a natural uh, pesticide. However, organic foods 
also use some sort of, um, you know, pesticides. They're just, uh, they're just natural. So, um, you know, it doesn't change the nutritional value of the food. Um, and, you know, I like to tell people, try to focus on eating a diet that is rich in any kind of fruit or vegetable, um, you know, over different, you know, processed foods, things that come in a package. Um, and that's enough to reduce your cancer risk. I think that um, focusing only on whether or not it's organic is um, unfortunately not going to uh, prevent, um, it's not going to prevent cancer from happening any more than if you were just eating lots of fruits and vegetables. So um, that is the answer to that question. So what else can um, contribute to increased risk of cancer? So, um, you know, you guys will kind of uh, hear this from Brooke, our genetic counselor um, at the presentation next week. She will talk about genetic risk um, and how that impacts uh, cancer development and certain cancers that are more um, genetically linked. Um, so genetics and family history can really play a big role. Alcohol consumption, smoking and tobacco use. Um, UV sunlight exposure, you know, something that we tell patients um, to do often is make sure you're using your sunscreen, get your skin checked, um, you know, wear a hat when you're outside for long periods of time. Um, and things like environmental carcinogens, you know, um, being exposed to uh, asbestos or things like secondhand smoke. Um, can also increase risk of cancer. But these are some, some other things that aren't food related that can, um, can increase risk. So let's talk about alcohol. Um, so there is significant evidence to support that drinking regularly. So this is um, eight drinks or more a week for women and 15 for men, or drinking heavily over time is linked to a uh, up to a 500 increase, 500 percent increase of developing certain types of cancers. So um, this includes any alcohol, including red wine. So um, often cardiologists will say, like, "Oh, a glass of red wine is good for your heart health." Well, even your glass of red wine is, um, you know, not enough to reduce your risk of cancer. Let's just say that. Um, so alcohol consumption chronically over time is linked to head and neck cancer esophageal cancer, breast cancer in women, um, liver cancer, and colorectal cancer as well. So um, alcohol is known to damage DNA, to raise body fat and estrogen levels, um, and it also impairs our sleep quality. So, um, you know, I think anytime people know this, like anytime you drink um, heavily on a night out, you probably don't get the best sleep that you've ever had. Um, and not getting good sleep chronically over time can really put a lot of stress and inflammation on the body. So um, it's just important to kind of weigh the costs and the benefit when we're talking about alcohol consumption. So another thing that is um, kind of significant in the research to, uh, to be known to increase risk of cancer is the consumption of processed meats. So processed meats are anything that are preserved by smoking, salting, curing, um, adding chemical preservatives. Um, and the evidence is pretty clear that it has been shown to increase stomach and colorectal cancer. Um, so processed meats do include things like deli meats, turkey, ham, uh, roast beef, breakfast sausages, things like pepperoni, salami, and other cured meats, um, hot dogs, beef jerky, anything with nitrites or nitrates, those are used as like a preservative for foods. Um, so, you know, people often ask me like, oh, what about the rotisserie chickens in the grocery store? Um, you know, something that you would get at ShopRite or Big Y, or, you know, those are pretty convenient. And I know a lot of us use them. Um, those do not count as processed meats. So you can eat those without um, feeling like you are um, doing something that is going to be harmful. Um, so I, I put on this slide some swaps that you could make for, um, for different meals. So if you normally eat cold cuts on a sandwich, um, you could do chicken breast or you could do, um, like I said, the rotisserie chicken is fine. You could do um, tuna salad is a great high protein, um, not processed uh, protein source. 
um, bacon or chorizo, you could do um, like a veggie sausage, that would be okay. Um, I, I think what they mean by that, the spicy veggie sausage is like one that you would get that doesn't have the nitrates or nitrites in it. Um, and then if you're using sausage or um, anything like that in a chili, you could always substitute for kidney beans or black beans um, or even just plain chicken or turkey. Um, ground meats, things like ground turkey or ground beef, those are also not considered processed meats, even though they're chopped very finely um, or you know, kind of processed in that way. They're not processed in the way that, um, you know, salami or bacon or chorizo, things like that are processed. So ground meats are also okay. So artificial sweeteners, this is kind of one of the last things that, um, you know, patients, patients have been asking me about for since I've been here. Um, artificial sweeteners are are non-nutritive sweeteners. So they don't impart, they impart sweet flavor to foods, but they don't impart um, any caloric um, energy uh, into the food. So you don't get any calories from them. Um, there are no current studies on either animals or humans that show a significant interaction between non-nutritive sweeteners and cancer development. Um, so that's, Good to know. I think that um, you know, in the '80s, there were some studies done with saccharin, which is a um, an artificial sweetener, um, and it was an animal study that showed um, an interaction uh, between saccharin and bladder cancer development. Um, but that study has since been um, kind of reevaluated, and artificial sweeteners are something that um, I don't think it's something that we want people to be having every day, um, but it's something that can be used safely. And um, it is often used by people who are trying to control their weight and control their body fat or um, even to control your blood sugar levels. So if I have a patient who also has a diabetes diagnosis and is getting treatment um, and is coming to me, um, you know, if they want to have a, um, like crystal light, for example, crystal light lemonade is, um, is a lemonade that is often made with artificial sweeteners. It has artificial sweetener in it. Um, and I would rather have the patient drink something like that than drink a, um, you know, a full strength, um, Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or something like that. You know, um, the crystal light lemonade is not going to, uh, cause them to gain weight and it's, um, you know, it's going to kind of save them those calories from that refined sugar in a regular soda. So five things that you can do to live a um, prevention lifestyle. So again, these are not things that are going to, um, you know, definitely prevent you from getting cancer or, um, you know, are, they're definitely not things that are going to cure cancer. That's not what I'm trying to say, but um, five things that you can do to reduce your risk as much as possible is to avoid alcohol and processed meats, like we talk about, um, to eat consistent, healthy meals with a variety of fruits and vegetables and proteins at each meal um, and healthy fats, um, becoming more physically active and adding in some resistance training to help build our muscles, um, drinking half your body weight in fluid ounces of water per day. So, for example, if you are a, um, a woman who is 120 pounds, um, you might want to be having about 60 fluid ounces of water each day. So that's kind of the general recommendation, you know, the eight, eight ounce glasses of water, um, you know, 60 ounces is a little bit less than that, but um, give or take, you know. And then the last thing is getting enough sleep and managing your stress. So, um, you know, stress on the body and um, chronic levels of stress and poor sleep can definitely lead to more inflammation and kind of, um, you know, a, a very inflammatory environment in the body, um, which, you know, is, is not good for just general health, but it's certainly not um, good for a, a cancer prevention um, from a cancer prevention standpoint. So trying to manage your stress as much as possible. I find that um, the more active people are, the more they try to get some movement in every day, um, the better that they sleep and the less they stress. So 
Um, I think movement is very important almost just as much as our diet. Um, so if that's not something that you currently have in your routine during the day, then um, trying to go outside for like a 15, 20 minute walk every day, start there. Um, and then, you know, try to build up as you, as you can. Um, but, you know, start small if you have to. Um, and that's kind of, uh, you know, my, my recommendation that I give to people for, you know, who aren't already physically active. So these are some of the sources that I use. These are just some um, different uh, websites. And um, as you can see, I like to kind of use the American Institute for Cancer Research. Um, the American Cancer Society has a lot of good um, information and the National Institute, um, the National Institute of Health as well. So um, these are all my information and sources. Thank you guys so much for coming to my presentation. Um, and now I will kind of move over and answer any questions that you guys will have. Nancy said, thank you, very informative. Thank you, Nancy. Question um, from Mary. Um, so um, this uh, patient asks, is green tea a good source to boost your immune system? Thank you for your presentation. Um, so we, the research on green tea is kind of, um, you know, it's, it, it's there. There's a lot of research about green tea, but it's kind of inconclusive. Um, I think green tea does have some good antioxidants for sure. And it can be um, it does have a little caffeine. So, um, you know, I, I don't want patients to be dr only drinking green tea, but if you enjoy it, it can be something that um, is included in a healthy diet for sure. Um, I don't necessarily know if there's a significant uh, increase in like boosting your metabolism, but, um, you know, it, it can be a good source of antioxidants. So. So Michelle asks, can we get a copy of the recording? Thank you. I think I'll let Renee answer this one. Okay. It looks like we're going to send it out to everyone tonight. I have a question. Another question from Mary is dark chocolate healthy and is uh, monk fruit as a is and monk fruit as a sugar substitute. So um, yeah, monk fruit is one of those things that um, is kind of a recent uh, non nutritive sweetener. It's another one of those um, sweeteners that doesn't have calories and can be used as a substitute for sugar. So I think that it's yeah, that's a great um, sugar substitute that um, that can kind of save you a lot of calories. So if you like the taste of it, sure, go for it. Um, and as far as dark chocolate goes, so um, dark chocolate is still chocolate, obviously, but um, it is, um, you know, something that can be included in a, um, in a well-rounded, you know, uh, cancer preventing diet. I don't, I don't see why not. We have to remember though, that chocolate is a, a source of refined sugars. So eating too much of it can lead to, to body fat increase. Um, but it can be included as part of a balanced diet for sure. So I have a question from Susan, how much exercise should one get each day? Um, so, 
you know, that, that kind of depends. I think the research is, um, is the most significant research shows that about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week is um, kind of enough to show, to show benefit. Um, you know, I, I like to tell people to do what you can, obviously, but um, a 30 minute walk five days a week, that'll get you those 150 minutes um, that you need. So, um, you know, even doing 30 minutes of activity, you don't need to be doing hours and hours. Um, I have a question from Gail. How do you feel about the big hype on balance of nature vitamins for fruits and veggies? Is the um, is balance of nature, is that like a, a powder or something that we add to um, to water? I think it it might be. Um, but if we're talking about like the vitamin and mineral powders that um, oh, they're pills. OK, um, so with with those kind of supplements, right, I think they're marketed as having lots of vitamins and minerals from fruits and vegetables. And, um, you know, what people don't know about those is that there's not um, really any fiber that comes with that, right? So um, you could get the, the same benefit from eating, um, you know, whole fruits and vegetables in your diet, whether or not that's as part of a salad or as a side dish to a meal or in a smoothie. Um, so, you know, with, with all of those kind of things, you're, you're really not getting um, with the powders or the pills, you're not really getting any of that fiber, which, um, like I said earlier, is good for our digestive system. And um, so I, I don't use them myself. I think that um, they can be very expensive and um, you can get the same benefit from, from eating your fruits and vegetables. Hannah, did you see the one about the balance of nature? Or someone put in? Yeah, I, I just answered that one. That was the um, that was the one about the um, the supplement pills. Oh, okay, thanks. So I we have another question um, from Mary. Um, are RX bars, which has all natural ingredients, including dates, healthy? Um, so I do. Um, I do think that like the, so RX bar is a brand of energy bars, right? And they have things like dates and nuts and seeds. Um, they can be included as part of a, you know, a healthy snack. Um, they are mostly carbohydrates. They do have a little bit of protein, I think, um, maybe from um, things like egg whites or the nuts and things that come in them, but um, they are mostly carbohydrates. So they will give you some energy, but um, and they can be included in as part of a healthy snack. I have a question from um, Dominique. Should we be eating more dark green salads instead of iceberg lettuce or romaine salads? That's a great question. So um, dark green salads or things that have like spring mix or any type of dark green uh, leafy vegetable is um, going to have a little bit more vitamin and mineral density than something like an iceberg lettuce or a romaine. I like to tell people that if you if you enjoy romaine lettuce or iceberg lettuce and want to include that as like part of a mixture for a salad, um, that might be a good idea or a good way to kind of transition to the more darker green leafy vegetables. Um, but you can still include them as part of a, a healthy meal for sure. Like um, if I'm going to have tacos, for example, as a as a meal. Um, you know, I'll put some shredded uh, romaine lettuce or something like that on a on a taco, and maybe I'll have some different fruits and vegetables as as part of another side to that meal. But um, so one isn't necessarily better than the other. We just want to be getting more of the the dark green stuff. I have a question from Vicky: um, Are vegan or vegetarian diets healthy? So. Um, so with uh, vegan or vegetarian diets, I think that 
Um, you know, often people worry about are they getting enough protein in their diet? And there are certainly ways to um, be getting adequate protein while having a, a mostly plant-based diet. Me, myself, um, you know, I know that my body feels best when I do include sources of protein like um, like uh, chicken and fish and eggs and, you know, animal sources of protein. But some people feel great when they, um, when they don't have those things. So you kind of have to listen to your body um, and do, you know, what feels, what feels the best for you. Um, I try to counsel my patients into eating a very plant forward diet. So making sure that we're including lots of, um, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables um, or whole fruits and vegetables, I should say, in our, um, in every single one of our meals and, and not eating um, like, um, you know, trying, trying to get more of those foods over like the very processed foods. Um, Mary says, I also found that 90 to 100% dark chocolate, which has very little to no sugar as a sugar alternative. Um, that's great. I think um, the very high percentage of dark chocolate, um, like the 90% or things like that can be very bitter. So if you like those things, definitely go for it. Um, but is peanut butter considered a healthy snack? So um, peanut butter is one of those things that can be also included in a healthy diet. Um, I like to tell people to not rely on peanut butter as like your primary protein source as a meal, because it does require a lot of peanut butter to get to um, kind of the protein that you need for, for it to be a, you know, a well-balanced meal. So um, try to use it as more of like a spread or in addition to um you know, another protein source that you're adding to that meal, whether it be, um, you know, some eggs or some Greek yogurt, but I love peanut butter. I think it's great. Um, I have another question from Gail. Are there any vitamin supplements that we should be taking or any natural supplements like turmeric um, or boswellia to reduce inflammation? So, um, you know, Research with supplements, like when people are getting, um, you know, treatment, active treatment for, um, for cancer, we do tell people to try to not supplement with things like that, um, just because they can have interactions with medications. Um, but I mean, I don't take any vitamin or mineral supplements other than like, I, you know, sometimes we'll take a multivitamin. Um, but any, um, any supplements that are like high doses, right? A high dose vitamin C supplement or, um, you know, high doses of uh, B vitamins and things like that. Those are really things that you can get from your foods. You can get them from um, fruits and vegetables and things like that. So if you like to um, flavor your foods with things like turmeric, you can certainly do that or ginger, um, but taking them in a supplement form really isn't necessary. We have another question. Can I receive this PowerPoint emailed? Um, I think that I'm not sure. Nancy asks, warmer weather means barbecue meals, means meats, avoiding hot dogs, anything else to be mindful of. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about grilling and meats and things like that, um, I, I do, kind of advise patients to stick to things like chicken or fish. Um, you know, I think um, hot dogs are something that is considered a processed meat. So that's just something to, um, to be aware of, you know, for sure, things like sausages. Um, when it comes to grilling meats, um, you know, charred foods, and, um, you know, there's some, some research to support that um, eating very charred foods, you know, can can be um, can be dangerous, but I, I think that that research is kind of inconclusive. So um, don't worry too much about grilling. Um, you know, I wouldn't want patients to kind of eat foods that has have been overly charred, but um, simply grilling your foods is not is not bad. What foods contain vitamin D? So 
Um, vitamin D rich foods are, um, things. so vitamin D is a, is a vitamin that's found in a lot of, um, like fatty fish. So things like salmon, um, it's also found in eggs, um, egg yolks in particular. And now when we're talking about plant-based sources of vitamin D, um, I mean, vitamin D really exists like mostly in animal, in animal sources. So things like milk and yogurt and cheese, um, So that's something to be aware of if you are, you know, having a plant-based diet to um, be mindful of your vitamin D consumption and to kind of, you know, if you want to get it checked and see if you're deficient, um, that might be something to look into supplementing into, but that's only if you're not getting enough in your food. Um, Dominique asks, is it okay to eat rice or pasta every day? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think rice and pasta are, um, are, are carbohydrate, right? They're a starch um, and rice exists in um, many different cultures and um, you know different cuisines, so does pasta. Um, I think that it's not about necessarily, you know, um, eating it every day, but trying to eating it, eat, trying to eat it in a um, small enough portion where, um, you know, we're, we're not getting too many calories from, from that. Right. So when I look at a balanced plate, um, it might be, you know, things like having your pasta and rice in a smaller, like a smaller dish as like a side, or, um, trying to make the focus of the meal be the protein and the vegetable, and then have like a smaller portion of whatever the carbohydrate is. Um, Mary asks, are shellfish okay to eat like shrimp, lobster, calamari, and scallops? So shellfish are safe. Yep. Those are safe foods to eat. Um, Fran asks, is it okay to eat soy products, things like tofu? Um, so soy is another one of those things that have been, that's been researched, um, especially with things like breast cancer, um, and, you know, things like prostate cancer, any hormone related cancers. Um, soy products are safe. We, the recommendation that I give to patients is things like tofu and edamame, soy milk. Um, those things are safe. We just don't want, um, our patients kind of using high dose, um, like concentrated soy supplements. So things like protein powders that have soy in them, um, you know, just to kind of err on the side of caution Um, but tofu is totally fine and it's a great source of protein. Energy drinks safe. So energy drinks, um, things like Red Bull or, um, you know, Celsius, things like that. So they do have a lot of caffeine in them. They tend to, um, and they do also have, um, sometimes they can have very high amounts of, of B vitamins, um, added to them as well. So it might be smart to, um, try to limit it to, you know, maybe like no more than one a day. Um, but I mean, energy drinks can be, um, you know, they can be safe in moderation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go drinking, you know, any more than one. Okay. So I think we're almost out of time, but I'd just like to thank everybody again for attending. And, um, and I'd like to thank Renee uh, as well for hosting and Jean and, um, and Sally. I don't know if Sally could make it on tonight, but, um, Thank you so much, everyone, for having me. I love doing these, um, and it's been so nice talking with everyone.